Previously on World History and Geography, citizens of the vast Roman Empire shared an official language, official religion, official currency, and common form of government. Rome, founded by twins, by the way. But with the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 CE, Europe became fractured politically and culturally. The Eastern Roman Empire would continue for the next thousand years as the Byzantine Empire, while Western Europe entered a period of repeated invasions and constant warfare. And now, our feature presentation. Ah, uh, Rome is a beautiful city for riding around on a scooter, falling in love, and riding around on a scooter. Come, we ride to Little Italy. But not in 476 CE. Throughout the 5th century, Germanic invaders overran the western half of the Roman Empire. This ushered in an era of European history called the Middle Ages. It spanned the years from about 500 to 1500 CE. You love the Middle Ages, don't you? Sir, yes, sir! With a nod to Latin, the Middle Ages are also known as the Medieval Period. Repeated invasions and constant warfare caused a series of changes that altered the economy, government, and culture. Merchants faced invasions from both land and sea, and their businesses collapsed. The breakdown of trade destroyed Europe's cities as economic centers. Money became scarce. With the fall of the Roman Empire, cities were abandoned as centers of administration. As Roman centers of trade and government collapsed, nobles retreated to the rural areas. Roman cities were left without strong leadership. Other city dwellers also fled to the countryside where they grew their own food. The population of Western Europe regressed to a mainly rural lifestyle. The Germanic invaders who stormed Rome could not read or write. Among Romans themselves, the level of learning sank sharply as more and more families left. Few people, except priests and other church officials, were literate. Knowledge of Greek, long important in the Roman culture, was almost lost. Few people could read Greek works of literature, science, and philosophy. The Germanic tribes, though, had a rich oral tradition of songs and legends. But they were illiterate and had no written language. As German-speaking peoples mixed with the Roman population, Latin changed. While it was still an official language of the church, it was no longer understood. Different dialects developed as new words and phrases became part of everyday speech. By the 800s, French, Spanish, and other Roman-based languages had evolved from Latin. The development of various languages mirrored the continued breakup of a once unified empire. Hey, you know, when I was younger, I was looking for work and finally got a job as a historian. I liked it until I realized there was no future in it. Anyway, at the start of the Dark Ages, the name given to the first half of the Middle Ages, small Germanic kingdoms replaced Roman provinces. The borders of those kingdoms changed constantly with the fortunes of war. But the church as an institution survived the fall of the Roman Empire. During this time of political chaos, the Christian church provided order and security. Along with shifting boundaries, the entire concept of government changed in Western Europe. Loyalty to public government and written law had unified Roman society. Family ties and personal loyalty, rather than citizenship in a public state, held Germanic society together. Unlike Romans, Germanic peoples lived in small communities that were governed by unwritten rules and traditions. Every Germanic chief led a band of warriors who had pledged their loyalty to him. In peacetime, these followers lived in their lord's hall. He gave them food, weapons, and treasure. In battle, warriors fought to the death at their lord's side. They considered it a disgrace to outlive him. But Germanic warriors felt no obligation to obey a king they didn't even know. Nor would they obey an official sent to collect taxes or administer justice in the name of an emperor they hadn't even met. The focus on personal ties made it impossible to establish orderly centralized government for large territories. In the Roman province of Gaul, a Germanic people called the Franks held power. Their leader was Clovis. According to legend, his wife had urged him to convert to her faith, Christianity. In 496 CE, Clovis led his warriors against another Germanic army. Fearing defeat, he appealed to the Christian god. The tide of the battle shifted and the Franks won. Afterward, Clovis and 3,000 of his warriors asked a bishop to baptize them. The church in Rome welcomed Clovis's conversion and supported his military campaigns against other Germanic peoples. By 511 CE, Clovis had united the Franks into one kingdom. The strategic alliance between Clovis's Frankish kingdom and the church marked the start of a partnership between two powerful forces. Missionaries helped spread Christianity. These religious travelers often risked their lives to bring their religious beliefs to other lands. Back during the 300s and 400s, they worked among the Germanic and Celtic groups that bordered the Roman Empire. In southern Europe, the fear of coastal attacks by Muslims also spurred many people to become Christians in the 600s. 
To adapt to rural conditions, the church built religious communities called monasteries. There, Christian men, called monks, gave up their private possessions and devoted their lives to serving God. Women who followed this way of life were called nuns and lived in convents. Monks and nuns devoted their lives to prayer and good works, but were not part of the hierarchy of church officials, like priests. Monasteries also became Europe's best educated communities. Monks opened schools, maintained libraries, and copied books. Monks acted as scribes, making beautiful copies of religious writings, decorated with ornate letters and brilliant pictures. These illuminated manuscripts preserved at least a part of Rome's intellectual heritage. They're called manuscripts because they are written and copied by hand, manually. Scribes would make copies of the exemplar, often working in groups in a scriptorium. The pages were on parchment, which was made from the hide of an animal, like a cow. Making the parchment ready to write on could take weeks, and you can imagine just how long it took to hand copy the large, detailed, beautiful books. You can also imagine how rare books were back then. Anyway, in 590 CE, Gregory I, also called Gregory the Great, became Pope. As head of the Church of Rome, Gregory broadened the authority of the papacy, or Pope's office, beyond its spiritual role. Under Gregory, the papacy also became a secular or worldly power involved in politics. The Pope's palace was the center of Roman government. Gregory used church revenues to raise armies, repair roads, and help the poor, and I guess feed the birds. According to Gregory, the region from Italy to England and from Spain to Germany fell under his responsibility. This idea of a churchly kingdom ruled by a pope would be a central theme of the Middle Ages. Meanwhile, secular rulers expanded their political kingdoms. When the Franks' first Christian king, Clovis, died in 511, he had extended Frankish rule over most of what is now France. By 700 CE, an official known as the Major Domo, or Mayor of the Palace, sort of like the White House Chief of Staff today, well, he had become the most powerful person in the Frankish kingdom. Officially, he was in charge of the royal household and estates. Unofficially, he had led armies and made policy. In effect, he ruled the kingdom. The mayor of the palace in 719 CE, Charles Martel, held more power than the king. Charles Martel extended the Franks' reign to the north, south, and east. Who invaded Spain in the 8th century? He also defeated the Moors from Spain. I'm so sorry, it's the Moops. The correct answer is the Moops. The Moors was the name given to the Berbers, the Muslim North Africans that were expanding into Europe. The historic Battle of Tours in 732 stopped the expansion of the Muslim Empire into the rest of Europe. This battle was highly significant for Christian Europeans. If the Muslims had won, Western Europe might have become part of the Muslim Empire. Charles Martel's victory at Tours made him a Christian hero, and he was known from then on as Charles the Hammer you can't touch this. Martel. At his death, Charles Martel passed on his power to his son, Pepin the Short. Pepin wanted to be king, not just the major domo. He shrewdly cooperated with the Pope. On behalf of the church, Pepin agreed to fight the Lombards, who had invaded central Italy and threatened Rome. In exchange, the Pope anointed Pepin king by the grace of God. Thus began, wait, he, he really is short. Oh, that's right, he's on his knees. Anyway, thus began the Carolingian dynasty, the family that would rule the Franks from 751 to 987 CE. Pepin the Short died in 768. He left a greatly strengthened Frankish kingdom to his two sons, Charles and Carloman. After Carloman's death in 771, Charles, who became known as Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, ruled the kingdom. An imposing figure, he stood six foot four inches tall. Wait, Pepin the Short's son was six foot four inches tall? That is the biggest mystery of them all. Anyway. Charlemagne built an empire greater than any known since ancient Rome. Each summer he led armies against enemies that surrounded his kingdom. He fought Muslims in Spain and tribes from other Germanic kingdoms. He conquered new lands to both the south and the east. Through these conquests, Charlemagne spread Christianity and reunited Western Europe for the first time since the Roman Empire. By 800, Charlemagne's empire was larger than the Byzantine Empire. He had become the most powerful king in Western Europe. In 800 CE, Charlemagne traveled to Rome to crush an unruly mob that attacked the Pope. In gratitude, Pope Leo III surprised Charlemagne on Christmas Day 800 CE and crowned him emperor. This coronation was historic. A pope had claimed the political right to confer the title Roman Emperor on a European king. This event signaled the joining of Germanic power, the church, and the heritage of the Roman Empire. To govern his empire, he sent out royal agents. They made sure that the powerful landowners, called counts, I am the count. They call me the count because I love to count things. 
I think they mean a different count. Anyway, they governed their counties justly. Charlemagne regularly visited every part of his kingdom. He also kept a close watch on the management of his huge estates, the source of Carolingian wealth and power. One of Charlemagne's greatest accomplishments was the encouragement of learning, which brought a little light to the Dark Ages. He surrounded himself with English, German, Italian, and Spanish scholars. For his many sons and daughters and other children at the court, Charlemagne opened a palace school. He also ordered monasteries to open schools to train future monks and priests, and even tried to learn how to read. A year before Charlemagne died in 814 CE, he crowned his only surviving son, Louis the Pious, emperor. By the way, pious means he was really religious. Louis was a devoutly religious man, but an ineffective ruler. He left three sons, Lothair, Charles the Bald, no, Charles the Bald. Wait, he doesn't look so bald. Anyway, and Louis the German. Who came up with that name? Yeah, who does come up with these names? Anyway, surprise, surprise, the brothers fought one another for control of the empire. In 843, the brothers signed the Treaty of Verdun, dividing the empire into three kingdoms. As a result, Carolingian kings lost power and central authority broke down. The lack of strong rulers led to a new system of governing and landholding, feudalism. I am the count. They call me the count because I love to count things. <laughs>